Happy Fourth of July weekend to each of you. Some of you uh, look like you, you went in your drawers and you got some of the, the patriotic gear. I tried with this shirt to get as close to the red and blue. It was not necessarily a flag shirt, but uh, it was one of the few one that was clean and ironed. So there you go. How many of you, that's, how many of you that's a good win? It's clean, no spots, and it's fairly ironed. Men, do I hear, I hear you? Yeah, I, I can see. Let's, the testimonies, are, we'll pray for the rest of you to get iron or whatever. But uh, my name is Rick, and I'm glad that you're here today on this weekend. And our, our goal in gathering as a community is to grow in love and care for each other, open our hearts in worship to experience God, receive His truth. And we like to explain what the Bible talks about, because how many know that it's not just telling you what to do, but how to do it? How many of, how many of you know your friends know a lot, but they don't know how to do it? Whatever that is, and you can think of your friends, whatever it is. You know, when you talk about exercise, we know we should, but sometimes how and motivated. And so as we study the scripture, we want to know not just what it says, but how it relates to us today. And we believe there's a lot of ancient wisdom in, in the Bible that God has written for us and given to us. And uh, we're starting a new series this summer called The Picture Bible. How many of you had a picture Bible when you grew up? You had like a one-page really good graphics and like a, a one-page summary of lots of stories. And that was your on-ramp to like learning the Bible. I, I still have someone somewhere who's real thick and heavy and great visuals. It might be a little outdated now. But we, we want to look at some of the iconic stories of the Bible, Old and New Testament, and go and do a deeper dive into them. We have like the, the burning bush, Abraham, David, Goliath. And today I'm going to talk about Daniel and the lion's, lion's den. You know it, right? I don't even have to read the scripture. You know the story. But I found that I was reading this, the story in preparation. There's a lot of things I dismiss because I know the story. But I mean, you know, sometimes it's good to go deeper and, and think and pray and read and, and revisit what these things said because our childhood and faith is different as we grow older. And, and so the title of, of my talk today is Thriving in a Life of Faith in a Secular World. How to Thrive in Faith Living in a Second World and a Secular World. We'll look at Daniel's story. And I remember when I was in L.A. as a private banker, I went on a bank convention to Las Vegas. Now, I had driven through Las Vegas, but I'd never been to Las Vegas. And I was surprised by the, the kinds of things that go on there. And... Um, and the people I went with, I didn't really care for because they were pushing the envelope of things that I would think would be appropriate. And I remember calling Elizabeth, like, babe, I really wish you were here. It's kind of uncomfortable, the things that people do when they're not all there. And, and some of them don't have much what they, what they wear. And just a lot of things. And she said, thank you for calling me. Um, and I found myself thinking, how different I was than them, and almost got like upset that they were different. And I recognized that Jesus never complained about culture like I do. Jesus said that, for God so loved the world. I don't hear, my Bible say he didn't complain about the world. He didn't say, oh, I wish to get a right world. God loved the world. And I find myself, as we live in this secular world or different values, we can tend to drift towards complaining about our world. And so as we look at Daniel today, I think there's some things that we can learn from this wisdom written 2,500 years ago and apply it to our lives today. And with all the social and political upheaval, culture wars, we can see ourselves versus us versus them. And there has been throughout history tensions between those that are in the church and those that are outside the church. And the inside of the church, people would say, they're in sin and they're going to hell and they're not abstaining. And I've talked to people outside of church, and like, they're all hypocrites. They all judge. They tell me I'm going to hell because I don't turn and believe like you. And there's been this tension between like, us and them that's never mentioned in the Bible. But it's, it's this inner tension that we have. And so I think Daniel's story is going to go more than just God saved him from the kitty cats by sending an angel. And uh, so the setting for da the book of Daniel, if, if we can refresh ourselves, is that it's set on a time of Babylon. Babylon was this world empire that conquered the known world. And Babylon had gone into Jerusalem and conquered the, the Israelites. And first human trafficking 
took their young people back to Babylon and said, we want the smartest, the finest. We're going to educate them, indoctrinate them, assimilate them, and we want them to be our leaders because we want to diversify and we want to control. And Daniel was probably uh, 13, 14, 15 years old when he was taken from his home in Jerusalem, along with several of his friends and others that were in the story, and began this new life away from family, away from their church and youth group, learning a new language, going to good schools, and you, you could think of how you would respond if that were happened to you. It was forced migration by military might and what he experienced. And he rises to prominence to become a great leader, serving a king with a different god. And so he has a great position of power, and he gets to a point where we'll read about where he has a life and death decision. Does he compromise and assimilate? Or does he keep his feet on this side of the line and not compromise? So he was, uh, it's interesting if you look in the story, the first six chapters that Daniel writes are in third person narrative. Chapter 7 through 12, he writes in first person and it's a prophecy that many study to look for end times. And that's another story because it's hard to interpret prophecy from 2,500 years ago. So he probably knew Hebrew and Aramaic, which is the business language. His friends and he were selected because they were smart and good-looking. They were given a life of luxury with clothes and food. They were wise. And when they were interviewed by the king, he put them in great positions of power because he, he believed in them. Until he had a dream. And he has a dream and no one can understand it. And Daniel, who we're going to read about, prayed three times a day and kept his faith. He says, tell the king, I'll, I'll go see him. Bold, I love his boldness. And then he gets his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and says, guys, we need to pray that God speaks to us and tells us what to say to him when we see the king, because we don't know. We can do this. Let's talk to our God. And what happens? God answers. He goes in, he says, this is your dream. This is what it means. And the king goes, whoa, I'm going to put you in charge of all my spiritual people and wise people, because you have something that they don't have. And God gives him tremendous favor. And then later, God reveals it, and he's in position of, of power. And his friends, who also are in the culture but not of it, don't bow to his 90-foot statue. And you know the story that they are thrown into a fiery furnace to be punished. And they are walking tall. And the king comes and says, I see a first pers fourth person there who looks like a god. And scholars say that that may have been the pre-incarnate Jesus joining them in the fire, and they were unscathed. And again, the king says, there's something about the God of these people that we are, have now in our leadership. All right, so that takes us up to where we are. Let's read Daniel chapter 6, 1 through 11, and 16 to 24, and we'll have it on the screen so we have a context for it. Then it writes, it pleased Darius the king to appoint 120 satraps. Satraps were like governors to rule throughout the kingdom. Two with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so the king might not, not suffer loss. So they were like right up there with the king, make sure he looked good and things went well. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So he's on the way up. At this, this important part, the administrators and the satraps try to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. They've seen him. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, my king Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict 
and enforce a decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, what did he do? He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, his God, just as he'd done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. Asking God for help is a long-standing need of ours, isn't it? When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issued can be changed. So the king gave the order. They brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continue to rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of, of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace, spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They had not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when the Daniel lifted from the den, no wound or scratch, one of the translations said, was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in, thrown into lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the, the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language and all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom shall not be destroyed his dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of lions. Amen. Yeah. We can go home right now. The story, just, the story just preached, didn't it? Interesting. Daniel's getting punished for being, being good. And Jesus, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, said a couple of things. He said, you are salt of the earth. And you will be persecuted if you love me because they persecuted me. Just, just know that's part of the job description. And what is salt? Back then it was not a, a spice to, to season. It was a preservative. It was, a, it was to keep dead things from going bad or bad things from getting worse. And I was making something last night with salt. Salt only works if you spread it out. If you gather together and keep it in a jar, it doesn't work. Right? It has to be scattered on whatever it's trying to preserve. And it gets into things. It gets onto things. It goes deep inside. And its job is to preserve and stop decay. But it has to be out. And Jesus said, that's what you are. You're going to be salt in the earth. And you will be persecuted for my sake. Now, I've seen people claim persecution for being stupid, idiotic, judgmental. And I don't think that Jesus is like, no, that doesn't count. If you're mean to your neighbor and you're judgmental towards people who need great grace, that's not, that's not persecution. Persecution is when you stand up for righteousness and someone says, I don't like how you worship your God. That's a different story. And that's, that's for a different time. But interesting that the, the response here is timeless. Three satraps, Dan is one of them. King says, I'm going to promote this one. <clears throat> and what do the other two do? They're jealous. They're like, we're getting him down. Now, he's, 
he's not running for political office, but those things are true today. He's going to be promoted. So what do they do? Let's go find some dirt on Daniel. Let's see if we can find some corruption. And why is that? Because they were corrupt. They thought Daniel was like them. We know he's, he's, he's a God-fearer, but if he's like us, there's dirt. And we're going to go find it. And so they launch a full investigation to see if he's getting any kickbacks. He's got self-serving interests of corruption. Someone's like speaking out and paying him. They don't find it. They thought maybe he's cutting some corners. He's slacking off after all these years. No negligence. His commitment is to the king's well-being and his interests. They're like, what do we do? He's not corrupt. He's not negligent. He's excellent what he do, does. There's no slacking off on his progress report. We got to find something else. And they go, it has to be something around his faith because that's really important to him. We see that as a guy who prayed three times a day and leading 40 satraps. And so they, they concoct this story of this go to the narcissistic king and say, hey, I've got an idea. What if you, we praise you for a whole month and no one can worship anyone but you? Oh, great king. He's like, that's a pretty good idea. I like that. That sounds good to me. Now, what would happen if someone were to try to find dirt on you? Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> True confessions in church. This is a great place to be. <laughs> How many of you go back to high school like, no, no, don't, don't talk to my friends or my girlfriends or, or my college roommates or you fill in the blank. Uh, <laughs> if people wanted to, they, they could find stuff on our finances or our things when we were stupid and, and sometimes when we we're older and mature and still made mistakes. But we, we would want to protect ourselves and guard against those things. Now, I, I, I'll, I'll be, true confession, eighth grade, I went on a mission trip. I was serving God, and I bought some illegal fireworks in Tijuana, and I came back with a switchblade. I don't know why anyone needs a switchblade when you're in eighth grade and you go on a mission trip. Like, this is cool. And this was back, you know, back in the day. And after a while, my, my mom said, get, get that thing out of the house. So I sold it to someone at school. Yeah, you know, you know where this is going. And someone ratted me out. I sold the guy on the football team. And next thing I get a call from the principal, I'm in his office, and he's calling the police station. And he's like, we need to measure how long this is because if it's this long, you're going to juvie. I'm like, I didn't mean it, um, but he didn't care. And uh, I remember he called my dad to inform him. And my dad basically said, if he did the cr crime, he'll do the time. <laughs> I can't save him. I remember that. And luckily, it was a quarter inch from being illegal and criminal. But I, I got busted, and next, my reputation as being a, a Christian junior higher was like soiled, which in some regards was good because now it's more popular, but for the wrong reason. <laughs> And I'll be like, you said you love God, and you're like breaking the law. I mean, so that's, well, so that's, I'm not going to go past eighth grade because there's much more. But you can think of your own lives and what things, if someone came after you, would they try to find to shame you or to discredit you? And the one thing they found about Daniel is he's committed to his God. He didn't have a big group. He didn't have a church. He's still in a foreign country. He looks Babylonian. He dresses Babylonian. He works in Babylonian. He speaks the language. But he does not worship their God. That's the line I don't cross. When I was 13, I came from Jerusalem. I, I knew what it meant to worship the one true God, and I'm not changing that. I'll, I'll, I'll simile, but I won't compromise. And so here we see Daniel, who has been conquered, but he has not given in to this part of his life. In fact, did you know that he's named after a Babylonian god, Belteshazzar? But his name Daniel, which his parents or someone gave him, means judge of God, judged by God. So the world gave him an identity, and he goes, no, no, I'm Daniel. I was named by God. I serve God. And it's interesting how we try to make a name for ourselves, because in Genesis 11, you know the story of the Tower of Babel. This group of people said, we want to make a name for ourselves. We're going to use technology and build a tallest building in the world, and we want to be it, the center of the world, the most popular, famous. How many of you know when you make a name for yourself, 
against God, it doesn't go well. If you want to use your riches or your prestige that is self-centered, as you see in the Tower of Babel, it does not finish well. There's confusion, animosity. God disrupts them. God says, I named you. I created you. You don't get to say a self-name. We learn from Babylon. They were like, we want no. God says, go, go try. You'll fail. And they did. And that's why we need interpreters today, because they, all languages were confused. So the first thing we see in this story is that to, to, to thrive in, in faith in a world that's secular, walk in character without complaint. There's not one time where we see Daniel saying, you know what? I wish I was back in Jerusalem with my family. Why I'm here in Babylon? I was hijacked and put in school here, and I'm happy to serve, but why can't? No, you don't hear him complain. Didn't mean that he didn't want to go back. But that wasn't the victim. He took his request to God. So much so that he said, I don't have much else. I'll, I'll talk to him morning, noon, and night. I'm a governor. I got responsibilities. But I'm going to prioritize morning, noon, and I'm going to go to my window, pray towards my homeland, and talk to my God. And he did it without complaining. No corruption, no negligence. His success allowed him to rise, but his anchor was praying three times a day. Why did he succeed? Because he's salt. He carried the image of God. And he brought the presence of God to a place that kept it from decay. So much so that if you read the history, every king that came in kept him on their staff. Most time when kings come in, they're like, let's wipe the clean of chief of staff. Let's put in our guys. They look at Daniel like, we need to keep him. He's good for the country. He's good for us. It's okay that he has his own God. He's smart. He's not corrupt. He's not selfish. He's not cutting corners. He's, he's aiming for the best of our society, despite the fact that he has a different God. The second thing we can do is if we want to stand up and be strong like Daniel, who followed God. He recognized God's, I have a king that I work for, but God's over him. And I, I serve and pray to him. And it's easy that you know, in a world where by himself, he could have assimilated, well, I'll, I'll kind of go with the flow. I've been here long enough. And the reputation. It's interesting. I was at the fireworks stand. I encourage you, if you have time, to go serve. Over the past couple of years, we have posters of uh, the, our various projects that we serve in the, the food bank, Camp Hope, Guatemala, Mexico, Kids Camp. And I talked to people, I'm like, oh, what does this go towards? I said, oh, we have the food bank we help here. And uh, Camp Hope, which we have people working there that help foster kids. we got our, these mission teams to Mexico. I said, that's so great. You guys are wonderful. Where is it? I said, well, we'll talk to this person over here because they're salt. They're on that team. This person works at the food bank. And when we go and take Christ into the community, we become salt and we make it better. Because we're we the hands and feet of Jesus, which we say every Sunday. Go out and be his hand. Go be salt. Go preserve something that's broken down. Bring the life of Christ into something that will help you like, oh, there's hope for me. I was running uh, through town. There's a couple of cemeteries. And whenever I run, I don't look for them. But sometimes when I was in Boston, New York, and you find places. And I will peruse them and look at the, the, the tombstones. And you'll see um, name, date of birth, date of deceased, loving mother. Date of birth, date of deceased, and community leader, author, of the, you know, signer of the Constitution. Oh, wow. And you see name, date of birth, deceased, nothing. I'm like, did that do anything? Or was there nothing significant in the dash that they wanted to remember by? And I remember being in fourth grade, and they asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you remember for? Like a pilot, a major league all-star player. And you realize, we don't get to write our epitaph, do we? Someone else writes that about us. People say at our funeral, this is who they were. We don't get to self-label ourselves. That's when you're like, oh, this is what this person meant to me. And so we can't be selfish and say, this is what I want to be known for. We do it by, because we're salt and we're light. 
and we bear are image bearers of Christ. So if we can't control our society, we can't control, and what can we control? Our response to circumstances. Daniel didn't complain. He spent time with God. So how do we thrive in Babylon, in, in our culture? You know who you are in God, in your identity, and you follow and obey him. We read a couple weeks ago in John, he said, those that hear what I say and do it are the ones who build their house on the rock. They'll stand when hard times come. The second thing we want to talk about is how to thrive in, in faith while living in the second world. Is humble yourself in prayer before God. He knelt down so you could stand strong before everyone else. You humble yourself before the, the Creator and the God and your Heavenly Father. And when you get up, you'll be ready to go. You'll be strong. You can face whatever comes. Like the old adage, we're strongest when we're on our knees. Telling God we're dependent on Him. We need Him. Here are our concerns. When we hear from Him, we cast our burdens on Him. You stand up and you can face the world. You can be salt and say, I, I'm going through things too. But God, greater is He that's in me than He that's in the world. Daniel found his strength on his knees three times a day. And he can, I, I can be a governor. There's no corruption. I'm not negligent. I'm excellent. Because I know who I am before God. It allows me to walk boldly before others. I'm, when I'm rightly related here, I can express myself the, the appropriate way before others. So they have this law that they put to, to trap Daniel. And he goes to pray. And they're waiting for him. And they catch him in the act. And he's not praying to Chalmush, the God that they do. And so they go to the king, and he says, I'm going to go pray anyway. That's a red line I'm not, I'm not going to cross. Can I be honest with you? I was reading the story. I'm like, what would I have done? I would be like, Jesus, can I take a month off? You know, there's this law here. I mean, I still love you, but can I just let, not, not keep my habit for 30 days? I'll still pray over my meals. Like, I would have found a way to not do what Daniel did. Can I be honest? Is that okay? I'm like, you know, I'm afraid to die. Also pray before, on the way home from work. Daniel's like, no. I don't care. This is important to me. This is my habit. I thrive best and I'm strongest when I'm on my knees. So I'm going to... And it said, in the time that he, the law came to pass, he said he didn't just thank God, but he asked God for help. He's like, God, I don't know what's going on. Can you help me? <laughs> I'm not going to change, but I need help. And what did help come from? A knock on the door saying, let's go see the king. You're done. We got you. We didn't want you to succeed. And so, it's, there's no, and the king was trying to figure out how he could overturn this because he needed Daniel. He liked Daniel. He's like, I, and they, of course, said, you signed the law. You can't change it. You can't even add another law to it to override that one. And I've been to many close countries where there have been people who have suffered greatly for their faith. I've been in Hindu nations where people were in prison for five years just for being caught baptizing people. If you were to go to a river and baptize, five years in jail. And the people who were, who were caught being baptized, one to two years. Just for, just for saying, I choose to follow Jesus, not the local deity. So this is real, then and now. And so what happens, Daniel, and you know that I learned something new. Daniel was 80 years old when he was thrown into the lion's den. I thought he was like David and Goliath, like you know, 15, 16, just a young guy out of college. He had been a safe trap for 60 plus years. He was 80 years old when they headed out for him and said, we need to get him out of here. He's a threat to us. Isn't that odd? He's still going strong at 80. He's going to be pres pres promoted to being head over the kingdom at 80. And they're like, no, we need to get him out. I'm like, leave the guy alone. He's about to retire. Not, not these other guys. We want him gone. We want him dead. Not just away. And so, you know, we, we heard the story. The king says, I got to do it. Throw him in. And he, he makes a plea. He goes, Daniel, um, May your God help you. 
and he leaves. And he can't sleep at night, he's not entertained. And we don't, there's no prayer from Daniel that we hear. There's nothing like, this is what I said to get me out of here. He's like, I'm going in. The next morning, the king comes out, rushes with an angel's voice. He goes, Daniel, did your God happen to spare you last night and save you? And he says, um, my God said it was not my fault. I did nothing wrong. And so he sent an angel to shut the mouth of lions, despite what you did. So I'm good. And the king lifts him out, not a scratch on him, and he gets pissed. It's like, I knew I did wrong. God just proved me in Daniel too. So he throws these officers with their wives and children in before they hit the bottom, they're consumed. But here's the point. King Darius writes a worship song. He goes, guys, a new edict. Everyone worship the God of Daniel. He's legit. He saves. He's delivered. He'll never be overthrown. And he has an encounter with the living God because of Daniel being salt. He, he couldn't sleep. And he's like, no one say a bad word about his God. I've seen what he can do. And the question I have is what would happen if Daniel was not delivered? What if he was killed? Would we have said, oh, he made a bad decision? He should have compromised? Because the story we tell ourselves is like, oh, if we, if we do what's right, God will deliver us. But the principle here is if we do what's right, we trust the results to God, whom we pray and trust. Because we don't know. And be honest, the book of Hebrews is full of stories of the Hall of Fame of Faith, people who were sought in two, who were beheaded. And the Bible says the world was not, was not even worthy of these people. That's how faithful to God they were. They were not spared. Sometimes God does spare. But I think we learn from Daniel that if we do the right thing, we trust God with the outcome. We know what his will is. And say, God, you know what's best. I pray through them today. You lead and guide me by your spirit. I'll pray and ask for help. And the goal of the answer is not the deliverance of Daniel. It's God's fame and worship. Daniel's example gets to the point where King says, everyone worship his God. His God is real. And in that moment, Daniel's God becomes King Darius' God. And King Darius says, everyone, this is the real God. I pointed to other things. He's the real one. So when God answers a prayer for you, tell somebody. Tell them what your God did. Give him glory. And say, if you have a need, he'll, he can be your God too. It's not just a poor us, like, oh, God, help me. No, when God helps me, it's to show me and show others that he wants to help them too. You hear me? Why? Because we're salt. We're light. Sometimes we'll have persecution. But he says, I will be with you. In this world you have trouble, but I'll be with you to the end. Daniel later died. This moment, God said, you're better for me alive than dead. So I'm going to deliver you because I want that king to know me. I want the 120 satraps that are under you. I want, to know, I want them to know you, me, as your God to become their God. So the goal of, of prayer is not just an answer for us, but for God to show us and people he's real. So how do we thrive in faith in a secular world? We pray our knees, humble ourselves so we can be strong before him. We walk with integrity. We don't complain. We become salt. We go out there and make a difference at Camp Hope, the food bank. We get to a place When we're thrown to lions, we pray and say, God, I trust you. My eyes, my hope is in you. There's nothing else that can do, right? And put your, you, can't, you can't even trust the king. The king doesn't have the power to do that. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then we're going to sing this song. Just application. A couple of questions and then I want you, as we sing the song, I want you to pray and say, where is the Holy Spirit speaking to you today? And it's not one of shame and guilt, but of conviction like here. First question, if the safe traps were coming for you, what would they say and charge you with? What proof would they have of you following your God? And the goal is not to feel guilty. 
like, oh, I should do more. I felt like, no, the question is, maybe there's a new step you could take in saying, I want to be like Daniel and spend time with God regularly and have an appointed time where I talk to him and he talks to me through his word or when I gather. I want, I want a new step of commitment to God and his people. Because the reality is we all have BC. We all, before Christ, we have things that could define us. But God canceled the shame and the sins that labeled us when we came to the cross. Our sins in the past don't define us or control us. Second question, are you currently thriving in your Babylon? Or are you complaining in a frustrated, angry, I think Daniel would say, thrive, be salt, but do the best of your company, do the, be the best citizen in your county, give your best to God, and be salt in your community. Third question, what influ influences you more, your fears or your God? Who has the loudest voice? What overwhelms you, the love and power and the grace of God? or concerns and fears? And that's not a trick question. That's just an honest question. And the last question, who is in control of the lions, really? I can imagine Daniel looking down like, those are lions. I've seen lions, and they're ferocious. But God says, I think Daniel said, I know the God of the lions. And nothing's happening unless he says so. So the fears that you face, let God's opinion and God's voice be louder than those fears. We're going to sing this song and then we'll close in prayer.